Hey gang, welcome to another investor presentation review today. As you can see before you, we're talking about Lilium ticker QELL. This sucker got announced a couple of days ago, maybe a week ago. Um, it had a lukewarm reception given the state of the SPACs in the last month or two. SPACs aren't as favored as they used to be. Uh, I've owned this stock since units were available so my cost basis here was under 10 bucks because of how units function um, i also owned warrants because of the units i sold a majority of my shares when it reached almost 14 dollars before anything was announced the craziness with SPACs is that a couple of months ago you could pay 14 dollars for 10 dollars worth of cash because of the craziness around SPACs. And at that point, I was kind of like, this seems overpriced. I wrote an article about that on my blog, timeintomarket.com. Um, and I sold, but I held a couple of copies because I, I, a couple of shares because I really like the team. Um, the announcement here uh, is interesting. The space is interesting. And I kind of wanted to take a look at what this space has to offer. Um, as you can see, the SPAC didn't get a little boost. Very small. It was trading under 10 bucks, actually. It's trading a bit above 10 bucks. Right now, 1027 pre-market, as I record this on a Monday morning. Uh, there are a couple of other companies in this space as well. Archer, ACIC, Joby, RTP. Uh, let's see how ACIC is trading. Also kind of in that same range. RTP is also kind of in that same range. I put some data together from the Archer and Joby presentations in a Google spreadsheet that I will share with you guys at the end of this video. Uh, but I wanted to compare those against what Lilium has to offer. You can kind of see that the majority of these plays, and I'm assuming Lilium is no different, are 24 plus revenue plays. So you're not going to be making any money as this type of company until 2024. And really the profitability doesn't start to come into focus for the other two companies until 26 which makes these valuations pretty crazy. Um, Joby RTP is valued at a market cap of 6.6 .6 billion, Archer at 3.75 billion. There, there is a good cash infusion per, for both of these companies. So the EV um, value is, is a lot lower, 2.7 billion for Archer, 4.6 billion for Joby. Still very, very high considering these companies are not gonna make any money probably until 2025. Um, the projections are clearly optimistic as well, given how far away they're projecting. So let's take a look at Lilium, Q-E-L-L. -E -E as always, I'm not a qualified financial advisor. Please do your own research and talk to a qualified financial advisor before making any investment. So let's dive into this sucker. I mean, this play, the RTP, Archer, ACIC, Lilium, Q-E-L-L -E play is all about flying mobility these are you, you can think about these uh, vehicles as a replacement for cars when it comes to short distance trips in busy areas i think that's really what they're aiming for here they're kind of showing this little cool um plane over manhattan you know so essentially hey maybe we can go from jfk airport to manhattan in five minutes instead of 30 minutes that sort of play i think Archer and RTP had a similar kind of discussion in their presentation. So we'll kind of see what they're looking to aim for and how much they're projecting in terms of revenue and how optimistic these revenue projections can be. I think when you when it comes to SPACs, you have to be realistic around these are speculative plays and you have to know the risk you're you're taking on when investing in in something like Lilium. So combining with Q with Kel Quell Acquisition Corp. Um, they have 380 million currently held in trust. Um, so hopefully a lot of that goes to the company in cash. Um, valuations are listed here. We'll kind of go into detail. But on, on paper, at least, they seem a lot more real reasonable than the other two companies that we looked at. Um, I'm thinking, again, this is also a 2026 estimated play. So you've got to take these numbers with a grain of salt. Who the hell knows what's going to happen in 2022, let alone 2026. So they have a enterprise value of 2.4 billion, a 3.3 billion equity value. So that means they're getting a good chunk of cash infused onto the balance sheet, just like the other two companies. Uh, transaction is expected to result in 830 million of total gross proceeds, 
proceeds raised to fund growth. So 380 million cash and trust, a good amount of pipe, which is you know additional investments from other companies, 450, 450 million in pipe there. It's going to be interesting to see if they lay out who the pipe contributors are. Uh, here's the team. You know, the reason I invested in Quell acquisition is Barry Engel. Um, good investment team for the SPAC. I think that's why some of these SPACs run up to where they ran up to. I mean, anytime you have a 40% um, a forty percent boost to your NAV, which is your net asset value of $10, that's really crazy. And I, I sort of saw that with a lot of my SPACs and I was like, man, I got to sell some of these and lock in the profit, knowing that I could potentially give up some some growth on the top end if some of these SPACs turn out to be amazing acquisitions. But so far, that turned out to be a good investment decision because SPACs basically fell across the board. You know, No matter what you were holding, no matter how good the team was, no matter how good the deal was, uh, there hasn't been a huge pop post-announcement and you're seeing the same thing here. So the market is, is a lot more skeptical of SPACs in April than it used to be a couple of months ago. Whether that changes or not is a question to be answered in the next few months. But right now, SPACs are probably a better investment than they were a couple of months ago because you, you can buy so many of them near $10. And if you know anything about SPACs is that, hey, they, they hold $10 of cash. And before the deal is consummated, you can call back most of your cash. So if you're buying for $10, it's essentially risk-free as long as you don't hold beyond the deal. Um, the deal consummation you know if the deal ends up sucking the the SPAC stock could drop well below 10 or it could go above 10 if the deal is very good but until that deal is consummated until a vote happens you can say hey give me my money back i want my ten dollars back so generally SPACs will stick around ten dollars until the deal is consummated so if you're buying around ten dollars and kind of waiting for a deal to happen the risk isn't huge some SPACs have fallen below 10 bucks recently which is even better for investors, even SPACs that haven't announced a deal. So if you're buying SPACs, you should be, if you're interested in SPACs, they're a lot better, they're a lot better as an investment today than they were two months ago when they were soaring, as silly as that sounds, you know. When when people are anti-SPAC, that's when you wanna be buying things like SPACs. When people are pro-SPACs, when they're rising 40% above their cash value, that's probably when you wanna be selling because you wanna sell high, you wanna buy low. Right now, SPACs are low. Um, that doesn't mean that Lilium's a good deal because they've already announced that the valuation might suck, but it does mean that in general, SPACs are a better deal than they were a couple of months ago. So they've got some investors, they've got Tencent, they've got some partners, Lufthansa, Palantir. I, I'm assuming these people are just in relation to the business that they plan to run. Um, if I looked at the Archer presentations, they kind of mentioned, hey, Archer has a deal with United, Joby has, partner, has a partnership with Toyota. So I think a lot of these companies are going to be dependent on the partnerships they can make, on the orders they can garner before any of this stuff is in production. Because for the most part, these flying mobility companies are way ahead in terms of going public and having a product, right? Usually you go public when you have something. These companies are going public via SPAC because it's a good deal for them, but they don't have any product. I think I think Archer doesn't even have a, a working prototype, um, while Lilium and Joby do. So you know these are X years away from actually being a, a serviceable product, and that's a concern as an investor because you're paying you know three plus billion in market cap for something that's not going to generate revenue for three to four years. And whether or not that revenue is realistic is another question mark, right? So these guys claim to be positioned to be the global reader, leader in regional electric air mobility. Um, good economics, good team. Um, they've got a, a solid total addressable market. You know, I think any of these SPACs are going to claim a, a solid total addressable market. They're going to have passenger mobility services and jet leases to enterprises. Pretty cool. I mean, I can see jet leases to enterprises being a big thing for them. Um, I mean, these things are probably going to be pretty expensive. Uh, I'm assuming the rides in some of these things are going to be pretty expensive, but who knows? I don't know if they're going to be that enticing to consumers unless you're a rich dude and want to you know, save 20 minutes on your commute from JFK to Manhattan or something like that. Um, they could also be good for regional flights that may be more expensive otherwise, right? If you're building a network in Europe, I, I could see this working well in Europe. I think Lilium is a German company. Um, I think, aren't they? Lilium German. I believe they're German. Yep, no German company. So if they if they set up a network in Europe, you know, European countries are 
close together. If you can take a flight from Berlin to Netherlands or something like that, I don't, I don't really know the geography, whether or not that that's feasible with the, the amount of, uh, time they can spend in air but I, I can see that working well in europe and areas like that where where a lot of hubs are close together um or even you know state specific hubs where you can kind of go around the tri-state area or something in the northeast or whatever or california um so aircraft their first product will be a seven seater electric uh, whatever vtol stands for <laughs> jet projected to offer the highest capacity and lowest noise in the market so they got a partnership for a network for 14 Verta ports in U.S. exclusive to Lilium in negotiation with 10 further sites to roll out European networks. So that's another thing I'm wondering about. You know, are these uh, aircrafts going to be based in airports or are they going to use um, standalone locations where it's much easier to get in and out than an airport, right? If I have to go through airport security just to get to this, why don't I just take a regular airplane? Um, especially if the pricing is that much different for local uh, travel, you know, I could, there's, there's travel, there's airplanes you can take between like Vegas and California. They're like 80 bucks one way, right? Is this going to be cheaper than that? And, or is this going to provide a much better service because you can skip the airport and just go through, you know, their own, um, uh, Verta port, which is somewhere away from the airport in a much less busy area and it's much easier to get to and park because that's kind of what sucks about air travel you know you got to go to the airport it's a whole thing and the whole thing sucks so you've got some in infrastructure partners you've got some tier one aerospace suppliers uh you've got some global investors you know tencent is kind of invested in everything but hey it's good to see tencent investing in something like this it adds a bit of credibility um, again, they're they're sort of saying, hey, we've got the two of we've got two of Germany's most important and largest airports. Again, if I have to go through an airport for this, ugh, kind of sucks. So again, here's what their their presentation is going to be like. Hey, you can go to Wall Street from Philadelphia to Philadelphia from Wall Street for for 170 bucks and it's only 30 minutes. How long of a drive is that? I don't know, probably three three to four hours. So clearly, much better to take this. Um, especially if the boarding time is a lot better than an airport as well. I think the flight is maybe an hour, maybe slightly less. I don't know if this moves faster than an airplane, but again, it's probably a lot easier to board and probably a lot easier to take off and, and get all set in this small seven seater vehicle than it is a, a, a 747 jumbo jet. So I could see there being more um, ease of use when it comes to something like this, as long as it's relatively cost effective and, um, and easy to access. Same thing with over here, Palo Alto to Napa, kind of what I was talking about. Hey, tri-state area, outside of the tri-state area. It's good to see that the range is pretty good. Wall Street to Philadelphia is a decent amount of miles. Uh, Palo Alto to Napa, 25 minutes, 130 bucks, same. Hey, you can uh, you can avoid traffic. So Lilium can revolutionize urban, suburban, and regional mobility. Um, 40 minutes, you save two hours in terms of, um, you know, probably taking a car, time comparison by car, yeah. So you can save two hours by car versus driving by car by taking this, but again, it costs you 200 bucks. If you want a five minute trip uh, between JFK to New York, it saves you 40 minutes, hey, New York traffic, uh, it's $65, it's a five minute trip versus a 45 minute trip via car. And again, if you were taking an Uber from JFK to New York, it's probably like a $20 ride, right? 15 to $20 yard, same with a taxi. So the, the difference is prices is, is there, but it's not outrageous, you know? But again, $65 for a five minute ride, mm, is that gonna be available to most people? I think the answer is no. It's gonna be available to like, you know, higher class rich patrons. Would I be taking this? Probably not. I don't have enough money to, to, to spend $200 on a 40 minute ride maybe outside of once just to experience it, but it's not going to be a day-to-day a, a -day thing for me. Um, but for businesses that work in this area that can afford to shuttle their employees in and out, shuttle their executives in and out, uh, for businesses that can kind of buy their own jet, you know, for their CEO to use, these, this could be a cool thing. Again, 30 minutes from New York to Philadelphia. You save an hour in, in drive time. It's only an hour and 30 minutes to go to Philadelphia from Wall Street. That's not bad. And it's $170 and it's a zero operating emissions vehicle, which you kind of want in the future. Um, and they are saying this is going to be estimated pricing based on the business plan. And it is the seven seater experience estimated for 2026. So these are things you have to take in, in mind, right? These are not times that are available today. These are times that are going to be available in 2026 when they actually have this thing up and running. They're based on a flight time with an average speed of 155 miles per hour. 
um, and they are comparing to an average car trip. What's going to happen if by 2026 um, automated vehicles are in play a bit more than they are today? Does this business plan change? I bet it does. I bet it does change quite a bit. You know, who's going to want to take a uh, $170 flight when they can take an automated vehicle trip to Philadelphia for a third or a quarter of the price? And maybe if it's longer, whatever, you get more work done. But that's kind of something to keep in mind when you're planning so far ahead. Similar idea for California. Um, really, what are they doing? They're aiming to turn states into neighborhoods. It's cheaper. It's dense and fast to deploy. And it, it works well versus ground transport infrastructure. It's true. If you wanted to make something like this, let's say you wanted to create train tracks to connect all of these cities and make travel between these cities possible. I mean, trains are pretty expensive still, right? So if you're talking about a train from, let's say, Boston to New York, it's probably going to cost you a, a decent amount of money, 100 plus, I would say. And it's still going to take a shitload of time. And building that infrastructure is very expensive if you want to connect all of these neighboring states. But you can probably do that with a network um, like this one at a much lower price and do it faster um, and potentially cover more of the areas that you would cover with, with um, high-speed trains even. So I, I can kind of see the benefit of this um, for you know midterm length travel versus trains. I can kind of see this being the future of travel. And I think that's where the expectations lie in terms of some of these valuations. But the answer is, will it, right? I, I think the concern that I have um, is, you know, when you when you look at air travel, there is a visceral aspect to it. You know, if any of these things have a lot of accidents before 2026, whether it's Lilium, whether it's Archer, whether it's Joby, that's going to change the way people think about this are people going to be comfortable taking these flights um when there is a risk of a horrible crash occurring and i'm not saying that's going to happen often and i know that that happens with airplanes but airplanes are kind of your only option and i know that that happens with cars in a in a bigger way than it does with any air f travel but i think people view those things differently i don't know why but they just do I think there's, like I said, there's a visceral aspect to airplane travel and crashes that come with it that may negatively impact something like this. Um, people are more comfortable taking a car than they are flying for whatever reason. It's just, it's just the way it is. Um, I know friends who are aware of the fact that air travel is a lot less dangerous than car travel, but yet they have to take anti-anxiety medication because, before they fly uh, because they are so afraid of a potential air crash, even though the rarity of those is, the, the chance of those is very low, but they have no problem driving a car every single day to work, even though car crashes happen on the regular and you can see them on the side of the road. So there's there's a different appreciation of the risk that comes with those things. Um, and I don't know if that's gonna impact this, this business model. Are people going to be willing to move within this small um, vehicle in the air as readily as they are taking an Uber, for example, in, in from JFK to, to Wall Street. Uh, I don't know. There is a business for moving people by 2040. They expect this to be huge. They're, they expect the moving things aspect of it to be huge. You know, if you can get uh, the last mile delivery using this vehicle. I, I You know, I don't think this is in any way going to be cheaper than hiring a bunch of trucks, especially once those trucks move electric. But, you know, I think this, this might be a bit optimistic. But for high value items or bigger items, it's possible that this is a better model than moving it via trucks across you know, mid-length mid spaces. Um, moving people, I think the market's gonna be there. But again, by 2040, I think the mobility market's gonna look a lot different. You know, The idea that, hey, there's gonna be automated vehicles out there. Are there gonna be other vehicle modes, other transportation modes beyond this that are going to cut into this uh, total adjustable market that they have. Are people going to prefer to do this versus take an automated car from the airport to their home in New York City or to from San Francisco to Napa? I, I don't know the answer, but there's a lot of question marks here that have to be answered before you're comfortable investing in something like this. And until those question marks get answered, you know, you're know you putting a lot of money at risk with, with the valuation you're getting. So you've got, hey, we've got industry-defining fully electric vehicle takeoff and jet landing V is that what that is vertical takeoff and landing oh my god maybe so you've got a seven seats including 
seven seats with a deleting painful. It's got a cruise speed of 175 miles per hour. It's got a range of 155 miles and it's got lower noise than open propeller EV tolls. So kind of what I want to see is, um, let's go to Lilium. Let's go to Joby. Let's go to Archer and see what they're, what they're actually offering because that's important. Lilium Aero Mobility, Joby Aviation, Archer Aviation. I mean, the Lilium thing looks very cool. Um, they've got a technology demonstrator. So they've actually used this thing. Um, they've got a working prototype. They're not quite there yet, but it does look very cool. So what does the jet look like? Um, I mean, this is, this is a cool looking thing. It's futuristic looking. Um, I would be like, hey, this is, you know, if I was thinking about it, taking a trip, you know, people take helicopter trips across above cities. Is this something they can do in something like this, right? Uh, and again, that, that points me, why is this better than helicopters? You know, why haven't helicopters taken off like and become this, you know, trillion dollar industry um, and, and been relegated to kind of like a also ran when it comes to transportation. How is this better than a helicopter? I mean, it certainly looks cooler. It's electric. It's probably quieter. Um, might be a, a smoother ride. Might be safer. Who knows? Um, but cool looking thing. Cool looking thing. Technology is there. Inside it looks nice. Let's see what Joby Aviation looks like. They got a f full film. Let's watch that sucker. I think Joby Aviation is ahead of everybody in terms of having a prototype that actually has been tested many, many times. But this kind of looks like a helicopter, like a plane mixed with a helicopter. Um, it it kind of looks like a drone, really. If you're if you're familiar with with drones, you can fly above spots with your camera. It, it kind of looks like a drone. Um, this doesn't doesn't seem like it has as much space as the Lilium um, vehicle, and it seems more helicoptery looking. But it still looks kind of neat. But when I look at this, this doesn't scream to me hey futuristic air travel it just kind of screams to me like hey this is an extension of what we already have it's a helicopter that's got slightly different um propellers uh, very cool though still very cool and then archer i think is kind of in the ideation phase still i don't know if they have any actual videos of them hey look at this the the running over the desert very cool pretty people in a in a vehicle and again, this, this sort of looks similar to what Joby's offering, which is a little helicopter with, with different propellers. Um, do they have their length here? Would the Joby have their rent length? Joby Aviation. I should not have quit. I kind of want to see if they have the amount of... So they're certifying aircraft in 2023. They have a thousand test flights behind. They're starting commercial operations in 2024. It makes sense. Does it any? Does it have anywhere how? So it's got a 150 mile plus range and a 200 mile per hour top speed. So kind of similar to um, what Lilium is offering in terms of range and speed. Like I said, I think Joby's ahead. They've had a lot more test runs than some of these other places. So they're ahead in in production. Let's see what the maker's doing. They have a 60 mile range, ew, and 150 mile per hour. Okay, so that range seems kind of crappy. You're not gonna be able to go as, as far as some of these other places, but maybe they have other vehicles in production as well. So back to Lilium. Lilium is looking in line with Joby. I would, you know, based on nothing in particular, I am not an engineer. <laughs> I am not someone who's knowledgeable in the Eve Tall space or the flying mobility space. Lilium and Archer, Lilium and Joby rather seem to be head of Archer in terms of range and, and speed and things like that. And in my non-educated perspective, Lilium's got the coolest looking vehicle. Look at this thing. It looks futuristic. It looks like something that's on the Jetsons. Um, and it uses the same stuff that jet, that's Jets use, right? Kind of, you get your jet engines. Hopefully if half of these fail, you will not crash and it will be safe to land still. Um, so you've got kind of the setup where they've got their own little hub, whether it's in an airport or whatever. Um, you've got a little Lilium one waiting for you. You've got a couple people boarding, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people. 
business jet format convenience of a car it does look very comfortable inside it does look kind of cool um it does look like a like a car basically right that's kind of what they're aiming for they're they're aiming for something that can replace your vehicle i'm assuming these chairs can be taken out so you've got a decent amount of cargo space for good for logistics you've got revolutionary technology hey you've got your ducted electric vectored thrust engines a lot of a lot of acronyms here um, chosen propulsion system has the highest market penetration, right? Kind of like I said, hey, we we are using the same thing that commercial jets are using. Um, seems to be safe. What are you looking at? You're looking at your competition, which is kind of what we saw before. Joby, Archer, kind of this propeller five-seater, which is hard to scale. Um, because if you've got these propellers, there's a lot of jet noise. If you make this twice the size, you've got to make the propellers twice the size, which is a lot of... Uh, noise levels and a big increase in footprint. Whereas with the seven seater, you can kind of scale it to a 16 seater uh, with more cargo space, more passenger capacity, more revenue potential versus the competitors. But again, these competitors are also well in the ideation phase. You know, Archer hasn't built anything yet as far as I know. And, and Lilium is still well into the ideation phase, right? Most of this stuff probably won't be ready until like 2023. A lot of this stuff is just, you know, graphics that are rendered onto a presentation. But hey, they look cool. This looks weird. <laughs> the long thing just looks weirder. But hey, a 16 seater would be very, very cool, right? You're kind of getting to a spot where you can move a lot more cargo, move a lot more people. But at that point, you know, when does it start becoming, hey, let's make it even bigger? We've made a 200 seater. Oh, wait, we've just made a jet but it's electric and what are they competing against you know are they just making these jets and selling them to um to companies like delta or are they actually becoming the delta and the maker of it you know i don't see many companies that are all integrated like that there's a reason that boeing sells their planes to somebody else and somebody else kind of manages the um business side of the airport and airplane and you know uh, selling tickets and etc ford doesn't deal with uh you know rental cars they sell them to rental companies ford doesn't deal with um they don't have their own uber they <laughs> they do something else they just make the car and and they move on so that's it that'll be an interesting um thing to see as the business model develops can they do everything are they planning to do everything or are they kind of depending on uh, other companies to take their technology buy it and do something with it because i think they're they are trying to do everything so so that's something to keep in mind um i think the business model is going to be hard to execute uh they're again they're planning to essentially you know the the business model is probably coming out now only because the battery technology wasn't there until today and that the battery technology is getting better and better so as um cells continue to improve their range is going to grow and i think that's the good thing about this type of business model is that you can also expand as batteries get better uh, but until those batteries are available the service range is just going to be too small and there's no point in kind of having a business model based on this like uh if i look at archer only offering 60 miles in range that seems low for i think what this business is trying to be um 150 seems better but you know as we get into the the latter part of this decade maybe you're looking at 200 plus miles in service range you can go further on one flight which is going to be cool you know maybe those trips that were impossible before like going from the northern end of europe let's say from sweden down to like greece i don't know how many miles that is but maybe it's too many those become possible in one trip in by you know 2028 or something like that if this sort of takes off uh, it's got to be fast charging. There's got to be a lot of cycles. Uh, and again, this is going to be an expense on their end. They're probably going to have to work with somebody else to make this battery technology happen. They are not, it seems like, making their own batteries um, to work within their system. So um, battery systems are years in development, tested and refined over several years to meet aerospace requirements, optimization of weight and cost through detailed structural design and material choices. Independent battery packs will provide redundancy to meet regulator safety requirements. Containment of any incident in battery cells in a mo module will allow contained safe flight and landing. Um, so again, if the battery, something happens with the battery, there's multiple batteries in there. If any um, explode on you or something by accident, it will not explode the plane, but it will contain it within one um, cell. 
and you'll still be able to make an emergency landing if that happens. And then integration of crumple zone in the primary aircraft structure will meet regulators' crash requirements. Super, super. That's really what I want to talk about when I look at something like this. You know, for whatever reason, I feel less comfortable in, an, in, in a helicopter than I do in an airplane. Um, and, and probably, you, you know, you, you do hear about helicopter crashes. I took a helicopter ride in Hawaii when I visited there a couple of years ago. It was awesome, but it was scary as heck. Um, it was an open door one, so maybe that was part of it. But still, there is something about that that makes me nervous, whereas getting in an airplane, at least for me, isn't too bad. Um, so you've got some leadership that are accomplished in aviation, Airbus. Um, people worked in Airbus, which is good. 400 engineers with combined 4,000 years of aerospace experience. Obviously, you want that. These guys were involved in the production of the Airbus, the most successful aircraft ever, A320, the Air A350, the A380. Um, so that's good to see when you have these dudes involved in something that is going to be flying uh, hundreds of miles up in the air and is going to be a bad deal if it if it has to fall. Um, so where are they in terms of uh, in terms of their timeline? They are uh, they have a certification accepted by the EASA and the FAA. The regulatory framework is there. They've received certification basis. Um, so right now they're basically manufacturing, engaging with regulators. They're going to start ground and flight testing with several aircraft and types by 2022. So not too far from now. Um, so really they're, they're still, as far as I can tell, most of these companies, especially Lilium and Archer are still in the aviation phase, right? You're, you're thinking of ideas to make this as, as good an aircraft as possible because once you start testing it, you don't want these things catching fire. You don't want these things exploding right away because that's going to put a big dent in your ability to sell this to the consumer that's out there that might be interested in taking one of these trips. Um, there's very few highly repetitive components, a lot less opponents than commercial airliners. 100,000 projected parts versus 3 million with commercial airlines. Jesus, that's a lot of parts still. 30,000 parts versus 3 million parts. But 3 million parts in a, in, a, in a jet? That's insane. And you've got fully automated, high-quality production of engines, actuators, and batteries. So, you know, that's going to be the interesting thing. Sure, they can if they can test drive it well, can they expand that manufacturing into hundreds, thousands of vehicles that you're going to need to make these heliports, whatever, veloports, whatever they're calling them? accessible and usable and are you going to be able to produce those things to a high degree of accuracy to make sure that they're safe and the quality is in place and there so again similar picture so what's the business model veritaport and crawling veritaports with ferrovia in florida so we're gonna have a business to consumer um business model which is basically hey passengers you're going to take Lilium branded passenger mobility networks and jet charters that are going to be launching in Europe and US initially. Then you've got business to business solutions, which might actually be a bigger part of this, which is governments. Can you develop, co develop passenger networks for regional governments um, with some you know, government grants, stuff like that? Can you provide enterprise passenger mobility to airlines and corporates? Um, enterprise, you know, are people going to be able to buy this jet for $2 million or however much it costs? for the use of a CEO. Um, I could see this being a better use of money than buying a full jet or something like that. Uh, it's cheaper, it's more effective. If you're only traveling to spots nearby, why not use this versus using a jet? And then cargo transport, you're gonna provide multiple aircraft to enterprises for freight. It's gonna be global for all three of those. So saying, hey, we're gonna be a light capital model that is going to allow us to deliver quality and scale in our operations. There's a digital platform. There's going to be third parties that are going to help with, hey, airline operations, pilot training, maintenance, vertiport infrastructure. Um, and then you've got Lilium, which is providing the aircraft and the manufacturing. That's the thing that I'm interested about. You know, who the hell is going to build these vertiports, right? They seem very expensive. Who's going to help them with kind of manage the airline operations, who's going to train their pilots, who's going to maintain these things. It's weird that they're not, they're not maintaining their own things. They're just building them. That's kind of odd. Um, but I, I guess it's cheaper to have the maintenance farmed out to somebody else. I don't know if other airplane companies do that, but I don't think they do. Um, so that'll be interesting to see. They've got their own cool digital platform. Everybody's got an app, kind of like, hey, we've got an Uber app. I can book and, and manage all of my stuff online. 
kind of what you want to do, kind of what's expected these days. Um, that's going to be interesting to, to see how it works for them. You know, they're kind of doing the Uber internally. They're going to be the one that's managing the infrastructure of the network app and the management and the planning and the consumer app. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, one jet can generate $15,000 in revenue per day. You know, you've got, hey, 20 minutes of boarding and charging. You've got a 30 minute flight. You've got another 20 minutes of boarding and charging. It's going to be interesting to see how that all functions. So basically, you know, this thing's going to be in the air quite a lot every day. Um, so you're essentially saying that, hey, I can make 1,500 passenger miles per day per jet. That's going to be 15,000 in revenue per jet per day, assuming that it's all fully sold out. No, actually, it's 75% load factor and 5% deadhead ratio. Um, you're going to be making $5 million in, in revenue per jet per year, and a jet costs you $2.5 million. So, you know, after a year, you're kind of doing pretty well um, once this thing is up and running. Obviously, the initial costs are going to be quite expensive, building the infrastructure to make it happen, building the jets, and then I think building the valid ports, unless it's, you know, in, in conjunction with governments of the area, is going to be interesting. Are they adding them to existing airport infrastructure? Are they building them some somewhere outside of that? You know, it's going to be kind of annoying if I have to go through the airport to board these, but it would be kind of cool if I didn't have to, you know, if they were kind of separate on their own, especially, you know, for cities like Manhattan and Philadelphia, it might be hard to do that because there isn't a lot of space to to build just a, a you know, a sizable Vela port. But if you're somewhere in the middle of nowhere in New York, you know, why not convert a, a parking lot or something like that into a Vela port? And hey, you've got easy access on and off if I want to fly into Manhattan and out of Manhattan, kind of like a train station that's outside of the city. Um, and if I can get in there in, in actually 20 minutes um, from parking to flight, that's pretty awesome, right? But if I still have to get there two hours ahead of time because it's like an airport, like a normal airport experience, that kind of sucks. You know, I'm not going to be all that excited about, you know, sure, it says it's going to take me 30 minutes and I'm going to save time. But if you've ever flown in through JFK, you got to get there like two hours ahead of time, even for domestic flights. So I'm not saving any time doing that. I'd rather just take a car and drive to Philadelphia because the the, the time that I'm going to save is, is wasted in the airport. So again, highly attractive business economics. You've got an annual revenue of 5 million, annual contribution margin of 25%. It takes two years to pay back the the cost of the jet and you've got a lifetime profit of a jet for of about 10 million, assuming a, about eight years in uh, in a lifetime. And then your B2B, you know, they pay you 4 million bucks to uh, buy this thing, a million dollars in, in annual service fees um, that are basically you have an immediate payback period and you've got a $5 million profit right off the bat from this jet because of the upfront payment and the annual service fees for, you know, eight years or whatever it is with probably some sort of margin from that service fee so it, you know it does seem like they're going to be making money from the service fee hopefully they're they're keeping that in indoors so they have 200 million dollars in commitments from leading partners so they're partnering with leading infrastructure partners in florida to build up to 14 verted ports engaged in negotiations with key infrastructure partners for 10 verted ports to build across europe and you've got a potential annual revenue of 1 billion from the lilium network by 2026 assuming that's all the b2c stuff and planned verted ports report two years of revenue growth for lilium after commercial launch so i mean some of these kind of look like they're separate from airports i'm sure some of these are going to be near the airport but if they're separate with their own parking that's going to be kind of awesome guys i mean you can kind of hey i'm going to park here i'm going to go in here i'm going to take this thing i'm going to get to x in in 30 minutes instead of having to take a flight and go into the airport experience which would kind of suck obviously there's going to be security risks with this they're going to have to figure that out um it, it's going to be interesting to see how this all works you know the fact that there's no you don't need a jet runway to make this happen. It, it goes up and down. Uh, this kind of looks like crappy CGI here. So they should, they should work on that. <laughs> so they've got their Florida launch network, 125 jets to be deployed. Looks to be covering about 14 sites in Florida in case you want to go from the Keys to Miami or whatever, from Naples to Miami. I think, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of vacationers in Florida that are going to be make use of this. So that's kind of cool to see. And you've got a similar network launching in Germany with a potential run rate of 900 million with 190 jets to be deployed. Kind of cool to see. Again, once this sort of thing takes off, I think it's good to see how it's going to work in these initial markets. There is the potential for a lot of revenue to be made 
if people are buying into this, if people are um, willing to invest in this, if government starts to see this as an alternative to congested uh, roadways or you know building expensive rail tracks and start investing money with companies like Lilium and say, hey, here's a grant of a uh, hundred million dollars, build a network in in Pennsylvania, build a network in California, et cetera. I think this is this is potential. This has the potential to go a long way. So they're training with Lufthansa, la 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 la. All right, let's look at the financials. So this transaction is intended to fund launch of and to, to fund to launch of commercial operations. So they're going to finalize the German factory for production, launch serial production aircraft, complete the certification, and launch the global revenue generating business. So 100 million will go to go to market strategies, production and engineering will go to um, 200 million will go to that, and then 500 million will go to talent and infrastructure. Interesting to see. They've got a diversified business model. Uh, you've got the turnkey enterprise solutions. So basically, initially selling to other companies. Then you've got the Lilium network launching by 2025, where people can actually go to, you know, if you're in Florida or in Germany, you can use their jets. And that number kind of goes to um, 5.9 billion by 2027. You've got 1,000 jets in operation by 2027, 30,000 tickets sold per year per jet on average by 2027, 600,000 miles flown per jet, $550 average revenue per flight by 2027. And over here, you've got the 4 million in upfront revenue per jet and then 6 million in revenue from recurring services per jet over eight years. So again, expectations are lofty here. Let's go back over here and kind of do the same thing we did over here. So you've got 200 by 22. Actually, we might have better numbers later. There you go, 246 in 2024. So they seem to think they'll be ahead in 2024. 1314 in 2025, 3306 in 2026, and 5867 in 2027 revenue. So these guys are growing at, you know, similar clips to some of these other competitors. Their expectations are in line, which kind of leads me to believe that, hey, at least they're, they're, you know, there are none of these companies' expectations are out of whack. I mean, Lilium seems to be more optimistic than Archer and Joby in terms of the revenue they can generate by 24, by 25, by 26, um, and also by 27, right? So they're obviously most optimistic. Uh, probably calls off, kind of sets off the BS, um, the BS meters a bit. Their EBITDA margin is only 25% compared to a mature margin in the 37% to 40% range for these two other competitors. So maybe the other two competitors are a bit optimistic on that. Did they share EBITDA figures here? Uh, they did. So minus 180, 24, 70 in 25. 708 in 26 and then 1440 in 27. So you can see these guys are going to be, you know, they're, they're expecting to sort of be, well, not really cash flow positive, but close to cash flow positive in this area. Um, they're really investing a lot of uh, their CapEx beyond 24 and 25 to set up their Lilium network fleet and kind of probably develop a lot of that, um, a lot of those those Verita ports in the various areas that they were talking about and grow that because a lot of that business growth happens after 2025. So they're starting a lot of that in 24, building on it in 25, 26, 27. You can kind of see that the investment is going to be large and that's the concern here is that they're not really cash flow positive even, even by 27 because their investments are going to be large, but they're going to be able to fund that with external financing at that point um, because they're going to have to. I think a lot of these companies are going to be either issuing more shares before or after 2024 or just taking on additional debt because the, the cash inflow is good. Did we even see the transaction? Um, let's look at the transaction here. The cash inflow is good. Let's let's see what we're looking at here. We're looking at a 3.3, 3320 market cap, 10 bucks. 
net cash of So it's 780 minus 166. So you've got an EV of 27, 2.7, enterprise value of 2.7 billion, so close to Archer. Um, that's interesting. So we've got some comparisons here. I've done the same comparisons here in terms of their current prices. These are a Google Finance uh, price, so it's gonna pull in whatever you have at the moment you're looking at these values are going to be as of today 4521 um, so you're going to see that based on today's price uh, both are pretty close to nav since the revenue comparisons are kind of similar by 2026 actually archer is higher up in revenue and higher up in ebitda you know if you believe these numbers um sorry lilium not archer lilium is the best value on paper, right? You've got a 1.0 price over sales versus a 1.7 and a 3.2 for Joby, a 1.7 for Archer. For your enterprise value over sales, it's 0.83 versus 1.2 for Archer, 2.3 for Joby. For your enterprise value over adjusted EBITDA, it's 3.9 for Lilium, 4.2 for Archer, 5.7 for Joby. So valuation-wise, at least based on their own shared numbers, like it shows over here, Lilium is a better value. They're also comparing it to other companies like Tesla or Neo or Xpeng. Um, the, the question is, how much do you believe any of these numbers? And honestly, my answer is not much because between these three companies, you've got a market cap of almost 14 billion for companies that are not going to produce anything this year. They're not going to get any revenue until 2024 and they're not really going to become a viable business model until maybe 2026, right? Which is where all of these valuations are based on. And what the hell, who the hell knows what's going to happen until then, right? There's going to be a revolution in self-driving cars and electric cars. Um, are other companies out there that are doing this? I know Airbus is doing electric vehicle um, aircrafts, much like this one. I'm sure Boeing will get into this space if it's profitable and viable. Um, why would companies like Delta, uh, United not make their own um, app and sort of buy, if, if this thing is going to be profitable, why can't United buy one of these vehicles and sort of run this sort of system outside of the airports? There's going to be a lot more competition. And this thing is so, so in the early innings of the space that picking a winner is a total crapshoot. Right. I you even if you knew a ton about this this business model, probably even if you worked for these companies, you wouldn't know which of these three is gonna be a winner, if any of these three is gonna be a winner. Does this business model make sense? I think it does. You know, I think there's something to it. I think the the short to mid range uh aviation comfort space is going to be an interesting one in the next couple of years. It's just a matter of how it's going to emerge. And there's a lot of question marks around it. Are people going to be okay with the safety profile of something like this. Will one or two crashes by either of these companies really push it back a couple of years? Will um, the, the Valley ports or whatever the company wants to call it, will those be efficiently built? Will they be user friendly? Will they be in locations that drive a lot of traffic and usability? Because a lot of their revenue projections are based on the Lilium network becoming a bigger and bigger piece of the pie. I think there's something to be said about this being a good enterprise solution. And I'm glad to see that Lilium is focusing on that because you can certainly sell these jets to rich people and corporations and even, you know, um, companies like Delta to, to, to ferry their employees from point A to point B in a, in a cheaper and more effective way, whether or not this is going to be a good uh, global um, transportation network that remains to be seen right whether or not they can make a lot of money from cargo transport you know that remains to be seen is this really a better thing than just you know electric trucks i don't know the the space isn't there maybe once they get to that 16 seater it might be useful but again how much cargo can they carry how much is it going to cost to actually develop this network right if you're telling me that hey by 2027 maybe the germany and florida networks are developed the cost to expand beyond that is going to be huge, right? And if by then, let's say Joby has 
the California market and Archer has the Texas market, does it make sense for for Lilium to enter the Texas and California markets? Are they, you know, are they picking the right markets to start with? Are those going to drive a lot of usability or are other markets potentially better? You know, is the tri-state area in the Northeast better or are other countries in Europe better? There's a lot of execution risk that comes with companies like this. And basically as a whole stock holder, you're being asked to wait for that execution to play out across four to five years at a valuation that's already at three to six billion, right? Look at something like Ford, right? Ford produces vehicles. They are valued at 47 billion. Um, look at something like Uber. They are valued at 107 billion. God, Uber is freaking highly valued. Is the combination of Uber and Ford something that Lillian wants to become? It, it, they clearly are, right? But they're not selling to consumer space. They're selling more to like the the airport space is Boeing kind of like a, a good comparison for this value at 147 billion. You know, can these companies become behemoths 10 years from now, 20 years from now? I think the answer is possibly, right? These companies could be 100 billion plus entities if what they're saying pans out to be true, if they can build, you know, multi-state, multinational networks. The opportunity is certainly there, but the valuation that they start with seems pretty high, right? Because your valuation based on 2020 and 2021 revenue is infinite. Based on 2022 revenue is infinite. Based on 2023 revenue is infinite. Based on 2024 revenue, you're talking in the 50 to 100x space, right? So you're really, really dependent on execution here. And that's the case with a lot of SPACs, so it's no no different. But a lot of those SPACs that you've seen before where, you know, the 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 revenue play doesn't start until 2024, 2025. You know, I haven't seen that many that were valued in the 6.6 .6 billion range like Joby is, or even in a 3.3 billion range like Lilium is. And I think that's a hefty risk to take. And I'm, I'm really glad that I sold at 14 when I did, because while I think this has the potential to run up, if there's another SPAC um, boost in the next couple of months, or if let's say ARC, with their space um, ETF starts picking up some of these companies, people can say, wow, ARK believes in them. I should believe in them and, and start buying more. And there could be a spike. Um, and I think this certainly has a lot of potential in the long run. I'm just a more conservative investor and I wouldn't want to hold a lot of these shares in any of these companies uh, because all of these estimates are so far out and they're based on nothing at all right when i did my ajax comparison last week you know i i, I enjoyed that one i like that investment more so because there's already a comparison out there that i can use to say hey these revenue projections are realistic because carvana did it so why can't kazoo do it ajax being kazoo in, in this scenario you've got three companies that are making their own you know pie in the sky projections based on nothing at all. And as an investor, you sort of have to believe that these projections are reasonable. If you do, then I think Lilium is the best investment of the three. Um, if you know more about te the technology, you might lean towards Joby because it's, it's more advanced at this point than some of the others. But again, their valuation reflects that. You know, you're paying 3x more, um, 2026 projections. But again, those projections are, are they worthwhile? Who knows? If you're looking at mature, uh, margins. Joby's projecting the highest. Archer projected until 2030. Ooh, crazy. But again, you're you're sort of buying into this as an investor and saying that I, I think this is a business model that can work. And if you truly and really believe that, then I think these, these values, um, while hefty, could make for an attractive entry point. And I think I'm sort of on the verge of, yeah, maybe, which is why I'm probably going to hold a bit of my Lilium shares. Um, but I've sold the majority of it already. You know, I've, I've probably trimmed my position from, let's say it was a thousand shares. Um, I'm down to 10% of that at this point, right? I sold the majority when it was 14 bucks. I sold a bit more after announcement um, because I was like, man, this, this valuation seems high. And the risk, the execution risk here is very, very high because it's new technology, right? With new technology, you've got, you've got an upside that's, that's got in immense potential, sure. So if this thing, 
is a 300 billion market cap industry in 10 years spread across three or four companies, you know, you've, you would have done well, but there's also the potential for this thing to, to do absolutely nothing, um, and, and fail and, and, and completely crash for lack of a better word. If the consumer interest isn't there, if people aren't willing to take these trips, if people aren't all that interested in paying 180 bucks for something that they don't deem as safe or cool or viable, if other competitive vehicles come out like you know electric vehicles that are self-driving um you know by 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 the time you reached 2026 2027 which is where some of these networks will be in line and maturing and actually usable who knows what's going to be out there right and there's question marks around this business model that i don't love um but you know because i think there's upside i'm going to hold a bit of it in the form of q e l l shares in the form of lilium because i just you know, I already own the company because I owned the SPAC before it announced the intent to merge with Lilium. So I might as well hold on to that. But like I said, I've sold the majority of it. I, I don't feel strong enough in this investment, nor do I know enough about this type of area to hold on past, hold on a huge, hold on to a huge amount of shares, right? Because I think the, the valuations are rich based on what I'm seeing today based on how far along this is in development for some of these companies, including Lilium, including Archer, including Joby. And the fact that I have to basically hold my shares for, you know, four to five years before any huge catalyst is going to be there. It doesn't make this for a very appealing investment. I feel like I could, you know, if things start to turn around and this becomes a more viable industry, I feel like there they should, there should still be entry points, but like 23, 24, where I could get this at a reasonable price before it really takes off, right? And if that's the case, if today's price doesn't necessarily look to me like an, an investment that will not be there two years from now at similar prices, I'd want to hold more, but I don't know if that's true. I don't feel like that's true because there are some some areas where this could tick up, you know, if people, if Lilium makes a, a partnership with Delta or something like that, sure, there'll be a boost. If Arc if the Arc Space Fund starts buying up these companies hand over fist, sure, sure there'll be a boost. So there's some some things that could send the price going up um, in the short term, but I think this is still going to be a story that needs years and years to play out. And I don't think that I'm missing out much by not holding on to a ton of shares today. Um, just in case I'm wrong, I, I'll hold a few shares, a small percentage of what I initially had, but I've already made a profit off this. And if this thing goes to zero, I'm still probably, I'm still well in the green in relation to, to what I initially bought it at because of the fact that I could sell at a 40% return a couple months ago before this deal was even announced. So those are my thoughts about it. I think it's an interesting business model. I think Lilium certainly um, is valued at least on paper better than some of these other competitors, but these valuations on paper are still rather murky. But hey, at least Lilium has the coolest looking ship, plane, Eftal, whatever it's called. So I'm gonna stick with that. And that's as good an analysis as you can do at this point, because some of these valuations are based on pie in the sky revenue projections. And yeah, sure, Lilium looks the best, but who the hell really knows? Um, I think it's going to be an emerging technology. It's going to be cool. If you want to get in today, these are the three opportunities you have, and maybe there will be some more down the line. Um, but this is something that you have to be ready to to wait for because the revenue is not going to be there until 2024, and the real revenue is not going to be there until 2025, 2026, and 2027. And by you know by 2030, if this business model is humming and really growing at the pace that this is projected to grow, this could easily be a hundred billion plus market cap company, but you know you could potentially still get in in 2024 when you get a much clearer picture of what's going to happen, of how this is going to work. And sure, maybe the price won't be at three billion by then; it'll be higher, but the return might still be there, and the risk might be a lot lower. So keep that in mind. As always, guys, I am not a qualified financial advisor. If you have any SPACs you would like me to talk about, let me know. Otherwise, uh, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think about any of these stocks, whether you're a holder of all three. Like I said, I am long 
Lilium, Q-E-L-L. I'm long Ajax, which I mentioned before. Ajax, I'm not long any of these other companies. And I also don't think I'm long any of the other companies I mentioned, but I might be. So thanks for watching. Have a good rest of your day and enjoy the week if you're watching this on 4521. If you're not, please keep in mind that these values here and the prices and the um, projections are based on values as of April 5th, 2021. If you're somehow watching this in 2022 or 2023, hello from the past. But these values that will be shared in, uh, in the description below via Google Sheets, which you can access, will not be all that viable by then. So keep that in mind. Please do your own research, do your own updates. And thanks for watching.